believe we are. Hello and welcome to the Gardena Valley Japanese Cultural Institute's Day of Remembrance 2023. My name is Alvin Takamori. I'm a volunteer with the GVJCI Day of Remembrance Committee and a vice president of the GVJCI board. On behalf of the GVJCI, I want to thank our co-sponsors for this event, the George and Sakai Aratani Community Advancement Research Endowment, the UCLA Asian American Studies Center, and Valerie J. Matsumoto, the George and Sakai Aratani Chair on the Japanese American Incarceration, Redress, and Community at UCLA. Also, thank you to Donald Inadomi for his steadfast support of this program. And thank you to all the organizations that agreed to be community supporters for this Day of Remembrance. I encourage everyone to go to their links on our website and learn more about these organizations. Also, uh, thank you for everyone uh, for joining us uh, on this uh, program. Um, as it turns out, it's a pretty rainy day here in uh, Southern California. So uh, having an online program uh, has its benefits. Um, at the latter part of the program, we'll be having a question and answer session. Uh, so when we get to that, uh, we're gonna try to separate the questions out into two categories, uh, historical clarification and redress and education. And you can put your questions and comments in the chat box at, at any point. Now, uh, February 19th marked uh, 81 years since President Franklin Roosevelt signed Executive Order 9066. This uh, enabled the US military to declare parts of the country military zones from which they could exclude anyone they wanted and they chose to exclude anyone with at least 1 16th Japanese ancestry. This led to the mass imprisonment of over 120,000 people. And to get a better understanding of what they went through, try to imagine if you were told you have a week or less before being sent to prison in an unknown location for an indefinite period of time. Think of the repercussions. You lose your job, your business. So now, you know, you won't be able to make your mortgage or car payments or any big ticket items, maybe like farming equipment. You also have to go think about all the things you have and decide, okay, what am I going to bring? Some things maybe you have to find a way to store and hope they aren't stolen and or sell them off. Pets weren't allowed, so you'd have to give them up. And for all the pet lovers out there, you know, that's like giving a part of your family. So you face the loss of all of these things not to mention all the stress and anxiety that comes with all of this. Now, imagine on top of that, you are being shipped off to a foreign country where you don't speak the language. And this is what over 2000 Japanese Latin Americans experienced. Not many people know about this story. Uh, even for someone like myself who has heard of it, I don't know many details. So today, we want to shed light on this little known aspect of the World War II mistreatment of people of Japanese ancestry. And we will all learn together. As an introduction, uh, we're going to be showing a short uh, 2004 documentary, Hidden Internment, The Art Shibayama Story, and uh, a brief video. So to give a little uh, context to all of this, we have our keynote speaker, Grace Shimizu, who is joining us from Northern California. She is the director of the Japanese Peruvian Oral History Project and director of Campaign for Justice, Redress Now for Japanese Latin Americans. Grace? Oh, your audio. <laughs> OK, technically challenged here. So please bear with me. Hi, my greetings to all of you. My name is Grace Shimizu, and I join you from the place now known as El Cerrito, California, which is within the territory of Huchin, the ancestral and unceded 
or stolen land of the many tribes of the Ohlone people who have been and continue to be stewards of the land throughout the generations. On behalf of the Campaign for Justice and Japanese Peruvian Oral History Project, I am honored to join you on this day of remembrance, which has become an important tradition in the Japanese American community nationwide, rooted in collective remembrance, reflection, education, and activism for redress and social justice. I'm also excited to be here with you, especially having learned that within the Japanese American community in Gardena and the surrounding areas, there are Nikkei from Peru, many having come after the war, raising families and enriching the community. I appreciate, I appreciate so much to be able to share this day of remembrance with you. Now, while some folks may have heard about or know a lot about the World War II incarceration and redress accomplishments of Japanese Americans, the wartime and redress experiences of Nikkei from Latin America or the Japanese Latin American internees, JLAs, is still little known. So today we have a wonderful opportunity to learn more together. We'll be using the documentary Hidden Internment, the Art Shibayama story as introductory JLA 101. This film was directed by Casey Peak and Iram Sheikh and produced by Peak Media in 2004. It centers on the life story of Art Shibayama, who at age 13 was forcibly deported from his home in Peru with his family and interned in Crystal City, Texas for the purpose of hostage exchange for US citizens trapped in the war zones of Asia. Art's commitment to truth and justice inspires the ongoing struggle for government accountability for constitutional and human rights violations. The documentary ends in 2004. So after that, we have almost 20 years of history, which was and continues to be in the making. So to provide an overview of that, we'll view excerpts from the 2023 JLA Redress Update video produced by the Campaign for Justice. This will include our redress advocacy at the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights, a body of the Organization of American States with the mandate to defend human rights, particularly in the Americas, and the groundbreaking commission decision in the Shibayama case, affirming that U.S. government owes redress and reparations to the JLAs. So let's get started. Take it away, Marissa. No fences, no guard tower, or, you know, no cottages, so nothing. Nothing looks familiar. No front gate. Doesn't leave anything. It's not like we wanted to come here. We didn't want to come here. We were forced to come here. We were brought here by the government. Probably 90 to 95% of Americans do not even know this happened. Do not even know that the United States went hostage shopping in Latin America and took 
Latin American citizens. Art Shibayama was just 13 years old and living comfortably in Peru when he was forced out of the only home he had ever known. During World War II, the United States government, in collaboration with several Latin American countries, orchestrated the forced removal and internment of over 2,000 persons of Japanese ancestry, which included both citizens of 13 Latin American countries as well as Japanese immigrants. Like young Archibayama, the vast majority were Japanese Peruvians. Half a century later, Art retraces their journey and uncovers their hidden history. Japanese migrants to reach Peru arrived aboard the Sakuramaru in 1899 as contract laborers hired to work mainly in agriculture. However, these early years were marked by a rapid move from the plantations to the cities. Hacia los años 20, 30, cuando la mayoría de inmigrantes que trabajó en las haciendas y luego de ahorrado un pequeño capital logran ir hacia las principales ciudades de, de la costa peruana se instalan como comerciantes o tenedores de pequeños negocios ¿no? en el área de servicios, comercio, etc. My grandparents had a, a department store where they sold uh, clothing and jewelry and things like that. Like Art's grandparents, more and more first generation immigrants, or Issei, began to find success in a variety of commercial ventures. As these early pioneers quickly became settlers, they set about to establish roots and raise families in their new homeland. It was an idyllic living situation for any child at that time. I mean, two parents, um, a loving home, comfortable home, and uh, and a father who spent a lot of time with his kids. We used to visit all the plantation on a weekend, you know. We go one weekend, we go here, and another weekend, we go over here. On a weekend, my, my father will drive. He even took me to the horse racing in Lima. And I was little, and he'll take me, you know. Uh, he'll go on a weekend. Summer vacation. I used to go down to Callao where my grandparents lived and stay the whole summer there. Because I was near the beach. My grandparents used to go swimming before they opened the store. So they would go six o'clock in the morning and I'd tag along with them and then come home and they had to open the store and I'd stick around till around maybe lunchtime. And then I go back to the beach again to meet my, my friends. And I stay there until maybe five, six o'clock and then come home. By the 1930s, as the world was entering into a global depression, there were well over 20,000 persons of Japanese ancestry living in Peru. Unfortunately, troubling times were just around the corner. With worsening global economic conditions, the more successful members of the Japanese Peruvian community were soon regarded by many in Peru as unfair economic competition. Fear and hostility were also fanned by Japanese military incursions in Asia and a virulent anti-Japanese press at home. Entonces se crea como un clima de, de malestar y conflicto con respecto a la, a la, a la comunidad japonesa en el Perú. Y, y su punto, uno de sus puntos más altos eh, 
se presenta en mayo de 1940, cuando esta campaña de desprestigio y esta campaña antijaponesa se expresa por un saqueo organizado. Tenía 11 años, bueno, cuando tenía, o sea, cuando hubo saqueo, ¿no? ese famoso saqueo, vivíamos en esta misma casa. Hubo un grupo eh, de saqueadores que quisieron entrar al negocio de mi padre, ¿no? Como sabía que en esta casa vive una familia japonesa, entonces empezaron a, a tirar piedras. Y los empleados de, que trabajaban junto con mi padre, inclusive los peruanos, ayudaron para que no puedan saquear el negocio. Entonces esa noche esto, un amigo de mi papá, que, amigo de negocio, ¿no? Era, creo que de, de aduana que trabajaba, vino en su carro, dijo que tiene que salir de esa casa porque es peligroso. Y, y se fueron. Y se fueron. Gracias a Dios, no, en el saqueo no, no sufrió daños el negocio de, de, de mi padre. While the Hayashi business escaped damage, others were not so lucky. By the end of the rioting, about 600 businesses, schools and homes were seriously damaged and looted. To make matters worse, the riots were soon followed by a devastating earthquake. Vino el terremoto. Vino el terremoto. Vino el terremoto y todos los peruanos que saquearon las tiendas de los japoneses pidieron disculpas a todos los japoneses porque creyeron de que el terremoto fue un castigo de Dios. Un castigo de Dios. As the community was recovering, political conditions were deteriorating. Anti-Japanese hysteria had set in. Unfounded reports of Japanese subversive activity soon led to increased restrictions on migration and land ownership. As war mounted in Europe and Asia, the U.S. sought to gain control of Western Hemispheric security. Also in Brazil, there were 260,000 Japanese taking orders from Japan. In Ecuador, within easy bombing range of the Panama Canal, German airlines had been established. Here was a fifth column ready to take over. In Havana, we met with 20 other American republics. There must not be a shadow of a doubt anywhere as to the determination of the American nation not to permit the invasion of their hemisphere by the armed forces of any power or any possible combination of powers. I remember on December 7, 1941, my father went to play tennis and he came right back and told us, hey, war started. And then he said, well, I guess it's, we're going to have a tough time because I know Peru is going to go with the United States. I remember that. Shortly after the Japanese military attack on Pearl Harbor, Community leaders were scapegoated and rounded up for detention throughout the Americas. In Peru, a blacklist had been generated. While not based on any real or credible evidence of Japanese subversive activity, the blacklist targeted businessmen, community leaders, and educators. In collaboration with Peruvian officials, the U.S. used the blacklist as the basis for rounding up hostages. These hostages were then to be traded for Americans held by Japan. In addition to a convenient means of expelling the economic competition, Peru had much to gain in its relationship with the United States. The government of the time had a certain advantage with respect to prestations, for example, from the part of the North American government. The United States lends Peru $25 million and signs a reciprocal trade agreement. Peru will receive American arms under a land-lease agreement. With Peru's full cooperation, the kidnappings began. Every time a U.S. transport came into the port of Callao, words got around and people, the head of the families, went into hiding, my father included. When the police came to our house, 
several times looking for him. And the last time, again, not finding him, they took my mother and put her in jail. My sister, who was 11 at the time, went with her because she didn't want our mother to go by herself. And as soon as my father found out about it, he came out. He gave, gave himself up. Aboard U.S. Army transports, they were taken. For weeks, Art was stuck below deck, shipped off with his family to an unknown destination and an uncertain future. After 21 days, uh, we arrived in New Orleans, and the women and children were let off the ship first and marched to a warehouse, and they were ordered to uh, strip and stand in line, line naked. My sister, who was 11 at that time, said that she never felt so humiliated that she had to strip in front of the boys. We got off the ship, they put us in a big room like a warehouse and everybody has to take their clothes off, you know. So we were all naked and they started spraying us with something. They shot DDT on your head, your arm, and you know, the vitals. But, uh, it, you know, we felt like cattle. You know, because we had to line up and then just go shh, 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 shh. Yeah. It took us two days, two nights from New Orleans to, uh, to Crystal City. And during that time, we had to keep the chase down. Most of the Japanese Latin Americans were interned in a Department of Justice camp at Crystal City, Texas. A 10-foot fence, guard towers, and floodlights surrounded this camp. The camp also held persons of Italian and German ancestry from the United States and Latin America, as well as Japanese Americans. Barracks, like our army barracks, you know, plain. Though they had lost both their freedom and their homes, most chose to hide their fears of an uncertain future from their children. During the internment, over 800 Japanese Latin Americans were included in two prisoner exchanges, which set sail from New York. Those who were not exchanged remained confined in Department of Justice camps until the end of the war. And in Chicago, more than a million sing and dance in the streets in the biggest celebration the Windy City has ever seen. Joy is unconfined. But for Art and the other internees, their long ordeal did not end with the close of World War II. The remaining Japanese Latin Americans were told that they were illegal aliens and would be deported. And because the Latin American governments initially refused to allow these internees to return, over 1,000 were thus deported to war-devastated Japan. When we arrived in Hiroshima, we got off the train, we walked and walked and walked. When we saw the city, there was nothing, no building. And some people were still, you know, wounded. And and they all looked so poor, and, and we were saying, gee, what a place, you know, this is where, so we're going to live. One of my cousins was a doctor, and everybody had to go and help, you know, into the city because all the hospitals were destroyed. And so he got this uh, radio, radiation, you know. He passed away a few years later, too, just for treating the, you know, patients. Meanwhile, as the camps were closing, Art's family, along with a few hundred others, were determined not to share the same fate as those who had been deported. With the help of attorney Wayne Collins, they fought the deportation and were paroled to work in Seabrook Farms, a vegetable processing plant in New Jersey. Seabrook Farms in South New Jersey is America's biggest, most fabulous truck garden, whose 15,000 acres surround a vegetable processing plant. From the white part forward is all gone. 
That's where I used to work, on the second floor. On the second floor? Yeah, feeding well, the... Feeding, feeding, feeding the, the, the thing the, through the holes yeah, into the floor, right. down to the packing line. Yeah, well, that From part of the down. building still exists. Boy, we work like hell. You know, I was in Seabrook. I was 13 years old. We never had a summertime and leisure and so on because we worked since I was 13. Every summer we worked. We wake up at five o'clock in the morning and truck will come and pick us up at six and in front of the cafeteria in Seabrook and take us to the green beans field. And we have to, will give us a roll and we have to pick a, the bushel of basket which is 30 pounds of green beans. And you have to go like this and pick. And in 12 hours, I was one of the fastest and I could only pick 10 baskets. And it was 30 cents a basket for 12 hours. So I get $3, and then they deduct 30% for income tax because we were on the illegal aliens. <laughs> so we may run away without paying income tax or filing tax return, so they take 30% off. So I get $2.10. <laughs> Isn't that ridiculous? After we went to Seabrook, uh my father couldn't feed the family of, uh, you know, of eight uh, because my mother was pregnant. She couldn't work. So th my sister and I had to go to work. So I never went to, I went, I never went to school again. Still fighting deportation, many families decided to settle in the United States as they saw no hope in ever returning home. For Art's family, this meant resettling in Chicago. I guess that's around the place where we used to, uh, we used to live when we moved from uh, Seabrook. Yeah, that building used to be right there by that playground where the playground is. There hasn't been a dance hall in a long time. Like many of his fellow Peruvians, Art set out to create a new life in Chicago where his family began applying to become legal residents. But fate again intervened in 1952, as Art was drafted to serve in the U.S. Armed Forces, despite the fact that he was still classified as an illegal alien. Though he served his duty in Europe during the Korean War, Art would not be granted permanent residency until 1956. When I come back from the Army, you guys were living here. After returning from service, Art soon married a young woman named Betty. Together, they started a family of their own. After working for several years as an auto mechanic in Chicago, Art brought his family out to California and started his own service station in San Jose, where he eventually retired. And though World War II had long since ended, for Art and the former internees, their long struggle would not fade with retirement. The legislation that I am about to sign provides for a restitution payment to each of the 60,000 survivors, Japanese surviving Japanese Americans of the 120,000 who were relocated or detained. Yet no payment can make up for those lost years. So what is most important in this bill has less to do with property than with honor. For here we admit a wrong. Here we reaffirm our commitment as a nation to equal justice under the law. However, Art was denied justice. Under this law, Japanese Latin Americans were deemed ineligible for redress as they were not U.S. citizens or residents at the time of internment. But now, you know, it's not like we wanted to come here. We didn't want to come here. We were forced to come here. We were brought here by the government. So how can that be illegal? That don't make sense. 
In an effort to call attention to their hidden history and to support efforts for redress, the Campaign for Justice was formed. The Campaign for Justice started in 1996, and it was founded by individuals and organizations who wanted to seek redress for Japanese Latin Americans. Uh, it was founded during the time of the Mochizuki lawsuit when that was filed, um, which sought to get redress for Japanese Latin Americans who were denied under the Civil Liberties Act. In response to public pressure, the Department of Justice offered a settlement of only $5,000 each, just one quarter of the $20,000 redress provided to the Japanese Americans. I wanted to get the equal justice. I wanted to regain the dignity for my parents. While supporting the decision of those who accepted the settlement, Art Shibayama, along with several others, chose to opt out of the settlement. He then filed his own lawsuit, preferring to fight for both redress and a full disclosure of the violations committed by the United States during World War II. Until the crime is over, meaning it has been fully acknowledged and fully compensated, it is ongoing. This is the point. This is the point that they have to recognize. That if they want to be just, they should be just with everyone and that they recognize their errors. Despite his efforts, Art was once again denied justice. His case was dismissed in the final months of 2002. Having exhausted their efforts through domestic courts, Art and the campaign have appealed to the international community by filing a petition with the Organization of American States. In addition to the legal route, the campaign is also pursuing a congressional resolution which would resolve all remaining redress issues. This includes granting equitable redress for the former internees and providing educational funding as originally mandated by the 1988 Civil Liberties Act. The significance of the Wartime, Justice, uh, wartime Parity and Justice Act is to try to finally write the final lines of that chapter in American history. And we need to do it soon because there aren't too many people living today who can tell you from their personal experience what we did. This marker is situated on the original foundation of the two-family cottage as a reminder that this injustice and humiliation suffer here as a result of hysteria. Racism and discrimination never happen again. How old were you when you learned of your father's and uncle's wartime experiences? How old were you at that time? I was approximately 11 years old when I um, learned the details about how the U.S. government kidnapped, deported, and imprisoned my father and his family. What did you witness as far as the impact of these experiences on you and your family members? Myself, I actually, for perhaps for the first time in my life, I felt fearful for my own safety. Um, it was actually a personal violation and vulnerability that I had not felt before. Um, and my brother and I were confronted with the harsh reality of racial oppression, um, and we felt defensive. But more shocking for me was when I later realized that this feeling or this theme of insecurity ran through my entire family's persona. Um, suddenly the words with liberty and justice for all that I recited in grade school every morning rang hollow. I wondered how my government could um, 
take my family's basic freedoms and human rights away. <coughs> my father and his family had done nothing wrong. Their only supposed crime was that they were of Japanese descent and the U.S. government had a needed excuse to take them as hostages to be used in exchange for Americans being held in Japan. Quite honestly, I cannot say that our family has handled the trauma of these wartime experiences very well. There's still a veil of denial um, and it still haunts us and still makes us feel angry and frustrated whenever we think of the injustices that our family had to face. Can you tell the commission please what you witnessed uh, as far as uh, the impact of your grandfather's death following these experiences? Sure. So tragically my grandfather died in 1976 at the age of 70. Um, at the time, he was suffer suffering from a severe depression, so it was very sad and upsetting for the entire family. Um, after the Shibayama's deportation from Peru, my grandfather spent the rest of his life trying to regain everything that he had lost in Peru. It wasn't until after my grandfather had already passed, that our family really appreciated all that he had gone through as the patriarch of the family. Um, his whole world was actually turned upside down at the hands of the U.S. government. Our hearts break when we think of the tremendous losses and struggles that he was forced to bear and the shame of not being able to protect his wife and his children from the unspeakable hardships must have weighed heavy on his heart. To this day, my family and I believe that the U.S. government killed my grandfather's spirit. Um, after his capit capitulation, and from then on, he was never the same man again. Gradually, he became silently entombed in a world of pain and isolation. I only knew him as a shell of his original self. And I just wish that I had shown him more love when I had had the chance. Hi, I'm Natsu Saito. I'm a law professor at Georgia State University in Atlanta. This opinion came down 17 years after the case was originally filed. And it tells us that the claims of the Shibayama brothers are really serious, fundamental violations of human rights. In this decision, the Inter-American Commission emphasizes that the principles of equality before the law, equal protection, and non-discrimination are among the most basic human rights and that one of the objectives of the American Declaration was to assure in principle the equal protection of the law to nationals and aliens alike in respect to the rights set forth. The Commission also says states have an obligation to provide redress or what we often call reparations for wrongs that have occurred even if they occurred a long time in the past. This is really a groundbreaking decision of the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights. It affirms the claims of Japanese Latin Americans who have struggled for justice for 75 years and reaffirms the obligations of the United States government to provide both access to information about and meaningful, quote, material and moral redress for longstanding violations of human rights. This victory is bittersweet since the decision was not made during my father's lifetime. 
Needless to say, it is extremely aggravating and disappointing that the U.S. government still has not acknowledged nor provided proper reparations for the war crimes committed against our family and over 2,200 Japanese Latin Americans. We would also like to acknowledge the thousands of men, women, and children of German, Italian, Jewish, and Japanese ancestry from Latin America and the U.S., including U.S. citizens who were imprisoned and used in the hostage exchanges. Until there is proper redress and justice, these crimes against humanity are ongoing. Hello. I don't know about all of you, but it's upsetting to watch all of that. Um, so uh, to go along, uh, let's get into our panel discussion. Um, I introduced Grace, but uh, just to give a little more background, uh, Grace's father was an Issei in Peru, who along with other family members were interned in the Department of Justice camp at Crystal City, Texas. And uh, along with uh, her credits as directors of various organizations. Um, she was also project manager of the uh, traveling exhibit, The Enemy Alien Files, Hidden Stories of World War II. Uh, another guest we have with us today is uh, Phil Tajitsu Nash, Nash, who teaches in the uh, Asian American Studies program at the University of Maryland College Park and serves as co-president of the board of the Asian American Legal Defense and Education Fund. Uh, he has previously served as a founding executive director of the Asian American Justice Center, uh, curator of the Asian Pacific American Program at the Smithsonian Institution's 2010 Folklife Festival, and has been a columnist for the New York Nietzsche Bay and Asian Week newspapers. Our third guest with us today is Chieko Kamisato, who was a Japanese Peruvian incarcerated at Crystal City. And she is the oldest child in the Kamisato family and has publicly stared, shared uh, the story of, of their struggles. So um, let's see here. Um, I guess to get started, um, um, Chieko, um, were there uh, any unique challenges that uh, the Japanese Latin Americans faced uh, while they were imprisoned in the United States? You know, I'm having a little trouble hearing. Oh, um, um, I was uh, asking if there were any unique challenges that uh, uh, the Japanese Latin Americans faced um, while they were imprisoned in the United States. Well, it was because we had no freedom and everything else when we came to the United States, they took all of our um, documents and everything. And then they told us we were entering the United States illegally. And uh, I think that was something that uh, was not right for us. What do you remember most about uh, your, your family's experience? Uh, from Peru, or do you, I don't know where to start. Um, um, my father was thrown into, uh, he was um, picked up by a detective and put him in prison. And he was in prison, the detective was during the war, and he was in prison for, for a while. And that not only my father, but most of the uh, Japanese businessmen, and the, uh, that they were, you know, the men that were blacklisted as my father was, and they were thrown into uh, prison, and they were there for about a couple of months, and we were able to thank him as uh, be able to visit him every day, taking food and the uh, clothing, and uh, after a couple of months. Then the, um, they shipped him to Panama. And he was there for quite a while, I think. 
What was his business? My father, we had, uh, my father's business was a bakery factory and store. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was pretty successful. But unfortunately during the war, the uh, Peruvian government confiscated his business. And, uh, and then not only that, then they, because my father was blacklisted and he, they were looking for him because he went to hiding for a while and they were looking for him. But once he came out, then I bet then they knew somehow. And then two detectives came and kidnapped my father and put, took him into prison. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was there for about two months. And not only my father, there were other, you know, Japanese businessmen there too. Mm -hmm. And then how did you find out about being sent to the United States? Well, you know, uh, we were able to, um, uh, we were able to visit him at the uh, prison. And uh, that's when I found that one, I think he was there for about a couple of months. And then one day when we went, we saw a big truck moving out when we saw many people in the inside. And then they told us that they were the men that they were going to be shipped to United States. And, but then we found out later that he wasn't in the United States. They said they sent him to Panama. How we found out was because uh, when we, um, well, the family was allowed to uh, join our fa father. So we, my, fa my mother <clears throat> applied for that. And we went, uh, we left the uh, you know, United States with my sisters and brother and, uh, <clears throat> we um, boarded the uh, ship where the soldiers with the rifles were there. And so we left the uh, Callao and by, uh, by the time we got to Panama, which it took about five days. And the, um, then I noticed that there were men, you know, going into, I mean, boarding the ship. And that's when I rec uh, recognized my father and was the one of the men. So they were in Panama as a later found out that they were, you know, used as a hard labor and all of that. And in fact, at one time when they were digging holes and my father thought that they were digging holes for them. And uh, so it was pretty traumatic for them, for him. But anyway, they joined us on the ship, but unfortunately they were all on the, on the bottom of the boat and, um, they were only allowed to come up to the uh, deck twice, uh, twice a day for about half an hour. And that was, you know, how we were living in the, in the boat, on the ship. Um, shall, shall I continue? <laughs> <laughs> well, I was just curious. So um, you come to the United States and um, you, right away, well, the well, it took us about 21 days to get to New Orleans. Mm -hmm. Once, you know, well, you know, once we uh, arrived in Panama, uh, then, you know, the men joined us and my father too, but we, he was only allowed to come up only twice a day for half an hour. And then we landed in uh, New Orleans at, uh, after 21 days. And when we <clears throat> landed, they took all of our, documents and jewelry and then the you know like uh, ego had mentioned that we were all stripped naked to take a, a shower and all of that and uh, i mean i mean you know line up in this big hall with the showers and uh after that then they sprayed us with ddt and which was awful i mean it was really stinging and it was terrible and uh, so after and after that, uh, they um, gave you know they returned all of our uh, jewelry and asset except our documents. They kept the, our document, and then they told us that we were entering illegally because we didn't have any documents when they already took our documents. And from there, you know, our father was able to join us, and then we got on the train and we went to uh, Crystal City. And uh, it took about a couple of days to reach Kucha City. And uh, we were able to um, 
uh, at least you know be a family in in uh, in, in the city. I mean, in Crystal City. Mm -hmm. What was life like in the camp? You know, for uh, me, because I was only ten years old, you know, it was like an experience. It was like adventure. So it, the camp life, what well, to me, it was fun because we had a lot of uh, activities and. I went to a Japanese school because they had Japanese school and English school. In our camp, we had uh, not only Japanese, but we also had German and some Italians. And most of the German people went to English school and then Japanese people, I mean, students went to a Japanese school. I guess eventually they were going to deport us to Japan. So for that reason, we had to go to the Japanese school. And um, so, the, so as far as life for us, you know, young kids were, it was fun because we had all sorts of activities like, uh, you know, we had Girl Scout, Boy Scout, uh, Boy Scout, and they had all sorts of, uh, you know, baseball and uh, judo and all of those things. So as far as the, as young kids, it was fun. I don't think my, it was uh, fun for our parents because they had nothing to do. And yet when they had to go out to work, they were able to go out to work, but they only were getting only like 10 cents an hour. So um, it was devastating for them because they lost everything when they came to United States. And uh, so mentally, I think they were just very depressed. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then um, afterwards, well, how did was the transition? Um, well, when after, you know, when we were in the camp for about two and a half years, you know, because uh, a lot of the, you know, I think about 900 were deported to Japan. And since we, by my part, you know, there were about 300 of the family that um, fought against going to Japan or being deported to Japan because they wanted to go back to Peru. But then the Peruvian government didn't want us back anymore. So, you know, so we were stuck in the country and I mean, in the United States and we, they didn't know what to do with us. And eventually then we, you know, Wayne Collins, the attorney from San Francisco heard about us and he was able to help us to uh, find a sponsors, you know, like for us, we didn't know anybody in the country so they were able to find us a sponsor in Seabrook Farm, New Jersey. And the people that had friends or family, they were able to go to, you know, with, to, the, to them because they could sponsor them. But the, most of us actually didn't have anybody in the United States. So we were all going, went to a, a Seabrook Farm to work there. And uh, it was very difficult, I think, but when we were in camp, the life was, it was good. And because everything was, you know, given to us every, you know, like in the morning, you know, every day we'll get the milk and uh, ice delivered because we had ice box in our, in our, you know, in our house. And, uh, but the once we left camp, uh, we were just left alone. I mean, we didn't have anything. We'd have no money, no anything. And uh, then we went to Seabrook and then, you know, and then our living condition, I think it was worse than we had in camp. It was like, a, you know, like, like a bungalow. And uh, then we had to buy everything because in the winter time, it was so cold. We had a one hot belly uh, heating system with coal. So we had to buy all of that. And my parents had to work in the factory, which they weren't used to because like my father, he was a businessman in Peru. And uh, so they weren't used to this labor type of work. And, you know, they weren't young anymore. So it was very difficult for them. And on, in the summertime, um, they used to work two, uh, two weeks, two weeks shift day and night because when my father worked during the day, then my mother will work on a, a nice ship for two weeks and they will rotate. So that's how, in the, you know, work in the summertime, except in the wintertime because of the vegetable and all of that, you know, it, it wasn't, you know, available. 
and they did not work during the um, winter time. But uh, as far as the working condition for them, it was very, very difficult because they never had worked like that before because they always you know, had the, the business. So it was not easy at all for them. I think our suffering began when we left camp and uh, because we had nothing, nothing was given to us. They just left us in the cold and uh, said, you're on your own. And I think, I think that's just completely injustice for us, what they had done to us, to all of us, really. Now, for yourself as a, as a student, they, they were teaching you English in the camp. But uh, what about for your, like, parents? And Well, I, mean, I didn't learn. I mean, we were, I mean, most of the people, the Japanese people went to Japanese school. Oh. And uh, German went to the uh, English school. Oh, so you, you didn't know any English? When, when... No, we didn't know any English even, you know, until we left uh, to Seabrook Farm. and. <clears throat> Then we started going to school in Seabrook. And because we didn't know the language, and I was about 12 years old, and we started out at third grade with the little children, you know, learning the uh, basic language. And because of the, we were older and we were able to, you know, capture the language much faster than they, they you know, they um, put us, you know, in the higher grades sooner. And, uh, and that's the that way we were able to learn the language. But uh, it, was, it was difficult at the beginning because, you know, I mean, we just didn't know the language. It was hard, but it took a while to get used to. Um, and then how did you learn about the whole uh, uh, redress uh, movement and the uh, process for the Japanese Latin Americans trying to seek redress? Well, I think I, well, I heard from mostly from Grace Shimizu. She was the one that was involved. And then so, you know, we sort of follow through her. And, and did you have any thoughts on how that whole process went? Well, I wasn't really that familiar with it, so I really can't answer that. But I think the redress should have been, uh, you know, I mean, it wasn't fair for what they have done. And I think it should have um the words doesn't come out that easily anymore for me um you know i mean it wasn't fair i mean they should have uh, done so much more and i know they i know they're still working on it uh, for people in i our, think probably phil is you know and grace are much more in tune with those you know than i am okay and maybe we'll transition to that. But just uh, so to let our audience know, you can, if you have any questions, you can put them in the question and answer or the uh, chat box. For that, uh, let's uh, shift to Grace and Phil. Um, um, how, uh, how did you get involved with the work for uh, the Campaign for Justice? Um, um. Well, I began to find out more about my dad's experience when I went with him to the fourth re reunion of the former Japanese Peruvian internees and our families in 1990, uh, when it was held in San Francisco. So while we were sitting around with our friends, we realized how many of the older folks were no longer with us, and that with their passing, we were losing a lot of our collective history. So six uh, Japanese Peruvian families in the San Francisco Bay Area formed the Japanese Peruvian Oral History Project the following year. And um, as we talked about interviewing our parents to record our family histories, we realized that we really didn't know much about what happened. We might have known like what happened to our own family, but didn't have the bigger picture and an, a clear understanding of how it all came about. So we began to do research and found there wasn't much written about it either. So uh, it began to dawn on us that we were preserving our family's history. Well, it was um, more than just getting our parents to talk into a tape recorder. We were actually embarking on a process of documenting firsthand accounts and verifying what little was being researched about that episode in history. It was also during the early 1990s, 
as Japanese Americans were receiving redress under the Civil Liberties Act of 1988 for the wartime violations of their rights, most of the JLAs were told by the US government that we were not eligible for redress because we are considered to be illegal aliens, even though it was the government who forcibly brought people here. So in 1996, the campaign for justice, Redress Now for Japanese Latin Americans was formed uh, to hold the US government accountable for the violations under the US constitution and for war crimes and crimes against humanity under international law. So I've been working with the JLAs and our families, the descendants, friends and supporters for over 30 years now. It's a labor of love and solidarity. Um, Phil, how did you come into this work? Uh, I am a, uh, a sansei on my mom's side. Uh, my grandparents came over in the early 20th century uh, to Seattle. And uh, my mom was born in Seattle. I was born in New York City. Um, on my dad's side, I'm a 13th generation white Anglo-Saxon Protestant. So uh, I'm a little bit of both. But um, what happened was uh, my grandmother, uh, who had been in Minidoka, uh, I was having dinner at her house and she put a picture of herself in the camps, uh, actually at Puyallup in one of the assembly centers. And I didn't know what that meant. I was still in college and being typical Issei, she didn't ask me anything and I wasn't supposed to ask her anything. So she, uh, I went home and asked my mom, what is that picture of grandma behind barbed wire? Uh, you can see that picture in some of the articles I've written, or I can send it to you if you're interested. But um, uh, my mom told me a little bit about the camps. This was in the late 70s. And um, I was uh, not planning to go to law school. I was pre-med at the time. I ended up uh, going to law school and getting involved in the redress struggle. Um, uh, I did a survey of the Japanese Christian and Buddhist churches in New York, asking people if they wanted to have redress. Surprisingly, a lot of people said, don't rock the boat. We've been through a lot of this. Don't, you know, we don't want to have any more trouble. But um, there, luckily, I was going to school at NYU, and some of my friends from the uh, gay rights movement uh, were involved in a group called ACT UP. And they were saying, um, you know, these big pharmaceutical companies had a cure for AIDS and we're all dying. Give us that medicine. And the older gays said, don't rock the boat. And I saw that and I said, wow, those younger guys are, you know, shaking things up. They're doing the right thing. So I decided to get involved too. And I was involved with the JCL in New York and um, met some people. I went out to the Center for Japanese American Studies in San Francisco in 1979. They had a conference and I met uh, Nikki Bridges and Jim Hirabayashi and Bob Nakamura, a lot of other people who were very involved with redress and kind of got me into the national redress scene. So I um, started writing for the New York Nietzsche Bay and then Asian Week. And there weren't too many people on the East Coast writing about this stuff. So that allowed me to write about things while I was also going to law school. And I met Michi Weglin, who wrote the book Years of Infamy. And uh, Michi and I talked a lot. I got to meet her got involved with uh, Bill Horry and his um, National Council for Japanese American Redress. Uh, I got involved with the Asian American Legal Defense Fund and we were working on um, providing legal backup along with the Asian Law Caucus and other groups around the country. And um, so I just got swept up more and more into the redress movement. And um, uh, so finally, when um, the bill started happening, uh, my Seattle connection got in touch with my mom that got in touch with me and said, we need someone to lobby on behalf of uh, uh, Mike Lowry's bill. We don't want this commission bill. We want direct redress. So I was hired by the Washington Coalition on Redress to go down and lobby on behalf of direct redress. And that's when I met some of the JACL people and others. And I was adamant we needed direct redress now. And subsequently, um, I see that Senator Inouye and others were right. We did need to have the co commission. I was a young, hot-headed guy, and, you know, but I, I agree now, years later, they had the right approach because we needed to educate people. But it was important, you know, in any movement, you have a variety of positions. I remember uh, Bill Horry wrote something saying, when I get redressed, I'm going to go out and buy myself a car. 
And I said, I wrote an article in the New York Nietzsche Base saying, how dare you take the civil rights of my family and ask for money to go buy a car? And he wrote back and said, well, you know, when your rights are violated, um, you know, somebody runs over your dog or runs over your leg or something, you get monetary redress and then you can do anything you want with that money. So again, I was wrong. I, my position, I had to change. And I think that was indicative of a lot of us in this movement. We grew up together, learning the different pieces of the movement, different strategies, learning from each other. So I was involved in many aspects of this. And finally, um, uh, helped to push for the 1988 uh, bill. And when that was passed, I, like many of us, was very happy. And um, then when we started to see what was happening, that uh, Japanese Latin Americans were considered to not be here under color of law, um, uh, as Chiyoko pointed out, and, and as Archie Biyama pointed out, you know, their, their documents have been taken away, and then they're called illegal. And why don't you have documents? <laughs> you know, it, it was just, it was like a bizarro universe. Mm -hmm. So, um, uh, Michi Weglin uh, passed away in 1999, and she asked me to be her literary executor. But before she died, she said, you know, we have to get redress for these Japanese Latin Americans and for the railroad workers, people born in camp. There are a number of people who did not get redress. I resolved to uh, continue with that. So I've been helping out in some capacity since then. Uh, I've been more active uh, recently. And um, I think that's really parallels what's happened to a lot of us in the Japanese American community. We are happy when redress phase one ended in 1988. We are happy to get our money. We are happy to see our rights vindicated. But unfortunately, we didn't see that phase two of the redress movement had started. And phase two is ongoing because people like chiyoko -san and Grace and others do not have a full measure of redress. And so I think that's why it's wonderful that um, you all are sponsoring this program today and we're talking about it because we all need to say to ourselves, you know, it was great we had the first measure of redress, but now we need phase two to continue. We need everyone to get redress. And by the way, when that happens, the next stage is to make sure that other people who've suffered injustice also get redress. Because what I've taken from my learning uh, during this is to go out and support other people who have injustices, whether it's the African-American community putting for HR 40 and trying to get redress for their enslavement or pushing for other forms of redress for other groups. So that's how I got involved in this and why I'm continuing to be a part of it. Um, so you're talking about the second stage. So uh, what kind of steps are needed to uh, move this thing forward? Well, um, there's a number of things that uh, we put on the uh, website. If you go to jlacampaignforjustice.org, uh, there are a number of things that the uh, uh, Japanese Latin Americans and their supporters are doing. Um, uh, the Japanese Latin Americans over time have pushed several bills in Congress. They've brought several lawsuits. Uh, as was pointed out in the film, there was a successful case that was brought before the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights, which is part of the Organization of American States. And a successful lawsuit, you know, after 17 years, there was a successful suit. And you would think that the U.S. government would say, oh, we're really sorry, we're going to go ahead and honor that. But we, along with 32 other groups who have filed against our home countries, uh, find ourselves not having a measure of redress. And so that's something that I and Grace and others are, are pushing for. We want to make sure that the U.S. government does eventually give a full measure of justice to Japanese Latin Americans and to these other people. Another big thing that we're working on right now at the University of Maryland where I'm teaching, we have just opened an exhibit called the Enemy Alien Files Exhibit. And if you go to the National Japanese American Historical Project website, uh, you will see uh, more about that. And you can see how this project does a great job of tying together the Japanese Latin American case along with the Italian and Germans and Jewish and other people who, uh, who had their rights violated by being kidnapped from Latin America and brought up here. So 
when you think about the extraordinary rendition that they suffered, this kidnapping and taking away their documents and treating them like pawns, it has all sorts of current ramifications because there's authoritarian governments happening all over the world right now. And there's people in movements trying to push for more authoritarian solutions to the national crises. And any time these authoritarian movements can say, we don't like you because of your background, where you came from, your religion or something else. And they could push these type of uh, quote unquote solutions to problems. So that's why uh, the education we're doing with the enemy alien files uh, is something that each of you could bring to your campus or to your community group. Um, uh, Grace could talk much more about that because she's been involved with this for a long time. Grace, do you want to pick that up? Yeah. Um, yeah, I think well, we're all kind of reeling from uh, this thing you're talking about, the ascendancy of authoritarian movements in the U.S. and many places around the world. It's like seeing once again emboldened racism, wartime hysteria, and the failure of political leadership. So when we're talking about the JLA uh, justice struggle, we see it now in this larger context where there is really an existential threat to our nation's democracy. The JLA justice struggle is an integral part of this larger struggle against racism, xenophobia, and authoritarianism, and for truth, peace, justice, and democracy. So JLAs continue to build on the educational and organizing work of decades our work has always been collaborative uh, within the Japanese American community, with the German, Italian, Latinx communities also targeted as the enemy during World War II, and with other communities targeted as the enemy, whether in the past or today. It is through our collaborative work that um, I think we're exposing the fuller historical truth of the US government's World War II domestic and foreign policies and actions, which led to massive constitutional and human rights violations across two continents. We are expanding and making more inclusive the wartime and redress narrative. By uncovering the fuller reality, the bigger picture, we are confirming how conditions of war and civil strife can and did lead to claims of military necessity and national security to perpetrate widespread violations of fundamental rights on the basis of national origin, ethnicity, and religion. And we are reaffirming the particularity of this also being a racist attack, intersecting with xenophobia and nativism against persons of Japanese ancestry, regardless of citizenship and residency. So it's through collaborative work that we are sharing, learning together and developing understanding, respect, trust, support and solidarity. And together we're building the personal and inner community ties and relations to prevent recurrence of these crimes against humanity and to envision and chart the way forward for a better society and world. Mm -hmm. um, I have a question here. Are there any thoughts on, on why the Japanese Latin Americans were left out of the, uh, I guess, phase one portion of, of redress, and why they weren't addressed in, in that first phase? of? of uh... Well, um, I was there in Washington when all this was happening, and um, I understand how these type of bills happen. Um, the JCL and some of our congressional Nikkei people uh, made an assessment that trying to include people who weren't American citizens might be difficult. And they decided to uh, push for the Japanese Americans, people like my mom who are citizens by birth or people like my grandparents who are citizens by naturalization. Uh, they figured that was something that they could push through. So while I didn't agree with it, I, I understood it, but I thought that that might be our way of getting a whole bunch of people over the finish line, and then let's continue to get the rest of the people over the finish line. But unfortunately, 
those people and other people did not pick up phase two and it just languished for many years. Now, to their credit, uh, David Inouye and the JCL and other people are, are pitching in now. They're trying to help the JLAs and other people within the community are very supportive of a Japanese American, a Japanese Latin American struggle during this phase two. So I hope that everyone who's on this call will go to the uh, JLA campaign for justice.org site and sign up and figure out ways that you can support that movement because um, the Japanese Latin Americans by themselves are not that many people. I mean, as was pointed out, there are 2,200 people at that time and a lot of people have passed on. Uh, we need some support. We need people to uh, continue this movement. So particularly if you feel you benefited by that first phase, then please come and continue that struggle for redress for others who are equally deserving. Um, Jekyll, maybe this kind of comes back around to you. Um, does, did Peru ever take any position about what they had done in all of this or, or, or apologize or anything? <laughs> I don't think so. I I can't remember. I, my mother mentioned something that they might have done something, but I don't think so. Um, I think there was one thing right around the giving of the land uh, in Lima uh, for the cultural center. Um, so I think, but um, I think it's true that in Peru, there really isn't um, a way where this uh, information is being taught, you know? So a lot of people don't know mm. that it happened and no, don't they, know how, why it happened. I was uh, interviewed. In fact, there was, there was a magazine that they, you know, they, um, in Spanish, and I was interviewed about our situation. And uh, so th I think that's the only probably thing that they have known about. And uh, I have spoken to a few students you know, from university, because I used to go to Peru once in a while, and I have families there to visit. And uh, so I will participate and discuss about our situation and what happened to us. And um, so, in, uh, so I have spoken to a few people and also some college students too, because they were, they seem to be interested. And uh, so but I don't think it's very well known as far as, uh, you know, what happened to us or, you know, what the situation was. And don't forget that the, um, the Japanese in many countries in South America um, suffered tremendous discrimination. I, I study uh, Nipu Brasileiros, uh, the Brazilian Japanese and Although they were not put through the same kidnapping and coming up to the United States, there were some who were put in concentration camps. They had travel restrictions. They had a lot of discrimination. And after the war in 46, they came within one vote of being forbidden to come into the country. So um, that type of discrimination, it was widespread throughout Latin America. Um, ironically, in Peru itself, um, a guy named Fujimori went on to become the president, oh, president. of the country, but um, he himself was kind of an authoritarian. Uh, uh, that gets a little bit into uh, Peruvian politics that goes beyond the scope of this here. But um, uh, but by and large, the Asian people in Central and South America suffered some of the same discrimination we study here in Asian American studies in the United States of being uh, suffering violence. Uh, restrictions on our businesses, restrictions on our ability to own land, uh, many other things. So scholars of Asian American studies have expanded beyond looking at Asian American issues to look at what we call diasporic studies. Uh, looking at my own family, for example, my grandfather left Kagoshima to come to Seattle in 1908. At the same time, his cousins were coming down to Sao Paulo. And it was only a few years ago in 2018 that I met cousins who uh, dance better than I do, eat hotter food than I do. And they are, you know, they've been down in, in Brazil for a hundred years. And luckily I speak Portuguese and was able to talk to them. And we've, you know, now we have Zoom sessions and we're able to keep in touch. But um, that was a piece of my history that I didn't even know. So uh, 
many of you who are in North America and you think your whole family might be here, um, why don't you check and see if some of your relatives are in Argentina or Peru or other places because you may have relatives that you don't even know about. Yeah, well, we have, you know, I have relatives in Peru, mm -hmm. but, and, and I travel, you know, I mean, I used to go there once in a while, but, uh, but the Japanese community is doing quite well over there because they have a huge um, complex, of, you know, with all sorts of activities and things. And I don't know, I don't think it, it's as bad as it used to be now. I'm not sure how it is, you know, now, but the, when I was there, I mean, I didn't feel like it was such a, a terrible, I mean, you know, against the Japanese because they really have a tremendous amount of, uh, facilities and everything else. And I think also, I don't know if they were supported by the Japanese government, but uh, I know they have, you know, like the hospitals and doctors and all of that, that, uh, that, that uh, they have built. And they do a lot of things for senior citizens over there too. So I imagine though, a lot of families were separated by, by the, this whole experience. Yeah, we were separate. Well, because you know, I you know I had uncles and cousins and everything. As far as a family, we were the only family that were they came to the United States, and the rest of them they were all still in you know you know in Peru. I had I mean uncles and cousins, and uh, I mean they're still there, and uh, but uh, you know I mean. And the word doesn't do, come like <laughs> and, and what do we know i know a lot of the people who were kidnapped uh, wound up being deported back to japan um what do we know about what happened with all of them well what i understand they really suffered because they were sent to you know deported to japan when there was such a devastated devastated place over there and they themselves were suffering so much and then when you know people from the states i mean went over there I mean it was like a nuisance you know that they didn't need and uh, because I have friends that you know went to Japan from camp and they were very not welcomed at all and uh, so it was very difficult for them because the Japan was really devastated at that time and then you know they felt that they had to fit another you know mouth and everything else that that they, they didn't need so it, you know the treatment wasn't that great from what I understand. Hmm. Are there any efforts to try to compensate them? I don't know what the situation is. Oh, you mean you mean under U.S. government reparations? Uh, uh, oh, anyone. <laughs> this, is, this is a sort of a multi-national uh, uh, crime, really. Well, under the U.S., um, if they uh, uh, had applied under the Civil Liberties Act or the, um, what do you call it? The Mochizuki Settlement. And if they were approved, then they would have, um, you know, qualified for uh, redress. Okay. But, you and know. The Mochizuki yeah. Settlement was for $5,000. Yes. Yeah, that was back in 1996. You didn't have to be resident in the United States to get it. But, um, but don't forget, um, when we focus on just the money aspect of redress, uh, many of us, all of us, I would say, of Japanese ancestry who lived through this in the United States or who were kidnapped from uh, South America, we're all suffering from intergenerational trauma. And um, uh, the people in Suru for Solidarity are doing a good job helping people to look at some of those issues, the emotional issues that people are dealing with. Um, I know that, you know, I had an uncle who died early of a heart attack. I had another one who had a stroke. I had a number of people had high blood pressure issues. There were a number of uh, morbidities and mortalities that were suffered from the stress of this. Uh, when you listen to what um, uh, Becky Shibiyama talked about with her grandfather and what he suffered uh, by not being able to provide for his family, uh, this was a, a tremendously uh, a terrible situation for everyone. And so those of you who are 
Japanese American uh, and suffered as much as you did, or as much as my family yeah. did. On top of that, the Japanese Latin Americans did not speak English and had been kidnapped and had been brought up here and were separated. Some people had been deported to Japan. Um, they weren't sure what was happening to their assets back in Peru. So you, you can just imagine the world of hurt they were feeling then. And like Becky Shibayama's family, they are feeling now because of what happened to uh, the grandfather who passed, uh, you know, unable to take care of his family. So this is an ongoing issue that that calls for us to get involved with redress to help the Japanese Latin Americans get their full measure of redress, but then to go beyond and to make sure that something like this doesn't happen to Muslims or people from the Middle East or whoever's going to be the next group that is singled out for this type of group-based injustice. Yeah, that, that's a good point. So what is it that can be done in order to prevent this sort of thing from happening to uh, in the future? I mean, well, I, uh, I, uh, Grace, you want to take that one? Yeah. Yeah, so yeah, that's a good segue, Alvin, in terms of <laughs> um, kind of uh, what we are um, uh, planning in this next stage, and then also what we would like uh, other folks to help us out on. So our main theme, you know, in this stage of the reparations movement is to educate and mobilize the public for education, reparations, and democracy. And uh, we've got three key objectives. Uh, during this time. Uh, one is to teach the Shibayama case in the law schools. Uh, another is to educate and mobilize the public for redress action using our powerful resources. And third, to um, support the social justice and democracy in action, including the passage of social justice legislation pending in Congress. So let's take a look at how this can be accomplished uh, with your help because we really are asking for folks to please get involved. So one is, you know, we want folks to spread the word about the ongoing JLA reparations struggle. Until JLA history is more widely known, we really do rely on you to help spread the word. The window of time is still open for us to secure JLA reparations while folks who lived through the wartime violations are still with us. So please tell your family, friends, co-workers about the JLA struggle for justice and direct them to our Campaign for Our Justice website to learn more. We're also trying to get um, you know, folks to learn about JLA history. So one of our priorities is to support the teaching of the Shibayama case in law schools. Uh, we're asking law school educators to teach the Shibayama case alongside the Korematsu case in their classrooms. This would bring together the teaching of basic constitutional rights and fundamental human rights law while learning the, about the real life treatment of enemy aliens and US citizens of Japanese ancestry during World War II. Doing so will remind students as well as the legal profession that the struggle for redress did not end with the passage of the Civil Liberties Act in 1988 and that phase two of the redress movement continues. It also reminds them that our struggles for justice are being litigated and watched in international tribunals, and that no one should be left behind when one part of an affected group gets redressed, but not another. One of our uh, powerful um, educational tools is the Enemy Alien Files Hidden Stories of World War II exhibit. We'd like you to bring it to your community or campus. This groundbreaking exhibit has been updated and is now on tour. Added as a new feature is the Enemy Alien Files web pages with the exhibit tour calendar, booking information, an online version of the exhibit and other resources. This exhibit is a stunning presentation of the World War II experience of over 31,000 enemy aliens of Japanese, German, Italian, and Jewish ancestry in the US mainland and Hawaii and those abducted from Latin America. The exhibit reminds us of the fragile nature of our constitutional and human rights in times of international and domestic crisis, as well as the human impact of government policies in the name of national security. 
So please help us bring this exhibit to your community or campus. We always uh, welcome volunteers uh, with the Campaign for Justice or Japanese Peruvian Oral History Project. You can help us preserve the JLA oral histories, which are our most treasured resource, serving to help preserve family legacies, to document testimonial evidence, and deepen understanding of our wartime and redress experiences, and to inspire intergenerational dialogue and activism. We invite you to help us collect, document, preserve, and interpret JLA family histories. We need help to digitize, transcribe, translate, edit, and archive our JLA oral histories. And then we have um, the update of the documentary, Hidden Interment, the Art Shibayama story, which we just viewed. So we need your help. Um, to update this uh, film, including its translation into Spanish, Japanese, and Portuguese. Then we can also ask you to share your translation, website, social media, technical and writing skills. And please contact us to attend our volunteer orientation session. Our next session is going to be in March. And then um, we always welcome financial donations to the Campaign for Justice or the Oral History Project. No amount is too small and all contributions are accepted with gratitude. So um, another aspect is uh, supporting social justice and democracy in action. One way is to support the passage of social justice legislation. So please contact us and uh, we can get you on our mailing list for updates on some of the social justice bills pend pending in Congress. And we'd like to highlight three of those bills today. One is called Neighbors Not Enemies Act, which would repeal the Alien Enemies Act of 1798, which is an outdated and xenophobic law targeting immigrants under the guise of war. It was the underpinning of EO 9066 and the alien, enemy alien program during World War II, and it was used by Trump to justify the Muslim ban in 2017. So we've got to repeal that bill or, and pass um, the Neighbors Not Enemies Act. Uh, second bill is Korematsu Takai Civil Liberties Protection Act which would prohibit unlawful detention based on race, ethnicity, national origin, and other protected characteristics. No person should be criminalized for who they are or for what they potentially might do. Third, we have the Commission to Study and Develop Reparation Proposals for African Americans Act, HR 40, S40. This bill would establish a study commission to examine slavery and its ongoing manifestations and impact in the United States and recommends appropriate remedies. It's been 35 years. Let's get this commission established now. So please stay in touch with us by following the Campaign for Justice website, Facebook page, and Instagram. And you can go to our campaign website to learn more. Together, we can make a difference. Si se puede. Yes, we can. Yaraba de kiru. Thank you. Arigato gozaimas. Gracias. Okay. Let me see, I see a few questions from the audience. Um, uh, uh, I guess, Chieko, um, how did I, I guess basically <laughs> it seemed almost like slave labor at Seabrook Farms, considering what how little they were being paid. How how did the families transition out of that? Well, it was pretty diff. You know, to begin with, it was a shock and uh, devastating to you know leave camp and go to Seabrook Farm because they weren't used to that type of life and that you know situation. But then we had to find a um, sponsor for us to leave Seabrook. And we had friends in Los Angeles, so they were able to sponsor us to uh, move to Los Angeles. But unfortunately for my parents, because they were already much you know, uh, older already, and both my parents didn't speak the language at all. So it was very difficult for them to find any kind of work. 
And my father, he was only able to find as a dishwasher or janitor work. And my mother was you know, able to just maybe clean the uh, hotel rooms and things. So it was very, very degrading and difficult thing for them to go through. But um, somehow we pers you know, persevere and through friends, we were able to come through you know, much better, but uh, it was not an easy situation at all. Um, let's see, I don't know. Somebody's asking a question about Jap Japanese Mexicans. Um, was there any information about what happened there? No, I don't know anything about that. Yeah, I think more information is uh, coming out now around the folks in Mexico. I think for a long time, uh, people didn't think uh, they were sent to the United States, but we know that there were Japanese Mexicans in camp uh, and they may have been um, picked up um, while across the border, you know, uh, rather than being sent by the government here. But we did have like in Crystal City, somebody from um, Mexico. Uh, but um, I think we're learning more that uh, Mexico tended to have a more internal program of uh, relocation and um, kind of confinement or detention. And, and don't forget, within the context of Asian American history, um, we had a number of people coming into this country from uh, uh, Latin America, you know, even before this. So, if, for example, on the Upper West Side of Manhattan, we have a number of Cuban Chinese restaurants. So, you know, Alejandro Wing or uh, you know, uh, Jose Chong. I mean, you get these people coming in who are trilingual. Uh, you can order your huevos fu young. And, uh, you know, we the immigration laws prevented people come, from coming in and prevented people from naturalizing, but they still would go to other countries and then come here from, from those places. So we have always had a community of people who uh, were uh, phenotypically Asian, but who were uh, from... Uh, who had gone to reside in Latin American countries. So uh, those of you who are interested in this, I urge you to go and take a look at that history. If you have those people in your own family, please go do oral histories, learn more about it, take Asian American studies courses, go to the Japanese Peruvian Oral History Project. This is something that needs more study, needs more research. So that's another way you can help to uncover this hidden history and, uh, you know, help to uh, bring justice to people when you can, and, and also to uh, help to bring people from the margins to the mainstream. Um, someone was asking for some clarification, Phil, uh, about, you made a comment about railroad, rail, railroad workers and the people born in camp not getting reparations. Yeah, the um, what happened was the way it was worded, uh, people who were affected by executive order 9066. Uh, so you had to be in the Western Defense Command in, in certain places uh, and people who were not there. So um, for example, railroad workers might have a house in San Francisco, but they were in on the railroad somewhere in Iowa. So they technically were not affected. Uh, and then there were dozens of people who uh, were born in the camps itself, who were not there when 9066 was promulgated. So um, those are just two classes of people. And obviously the 2,200 people who were Japanese uh, Latin Americans, you know, these are people who were excluded uh, from getting redress. So if you want to have a full measure of redress for everyone who was affected, we should be pushing for that. And also like looking at the people of I'm Italian and uh, German ancestry, Jewish people from uh, Latin America, we we should push for all of these people to get redress. We, you know, once we get our own redress, doesn't mean we stop pushing. Um, yes, sir. Another question here: uh, do, you, do you have any idea what percentage of Japanese Latin Americans were were taken? Is there a percentage? Uh, there is a percentage, but I don't have it at my fingertips. <laughs> so sorry. 
Yeah, I don't yeah. either. No. Maybe that could be answered. In, in yeah. But... So, um, I guess, why do you think it's, a, I guess you were sort of talking about this a little bit, uh, the importance of sharing the stories. Um, um, and I guess, yeah, I guess with the oral history project and, and so forth. Um, let's see. Well, well, um, just to address your question about the people who were rounded up, um, in the U.S. and in Latin America, we tended to get the people who were the community leaders, who were the Buddhist priests, who were the business people, and um, they were the ones seen as possibly having the connections to Japan. Quite frankly, when you look at the economic motive of what was going on, you know, by taking these people's businesses, taking their land, we see the rise of large-scale agribusiness after World War II because a lot of the fertile land that Japanese Americans had worked very hard to build in California for their truck farms was taken away from them. And so um, uh, there were definitely economic motives as well. So um, uh, it's no surprise that these elders in the community were rounded up. And again, what I keep reminding my students is that when you have a legitimate interest in protecting your country, nobody's saying that the US didn't have a right to protect itself, but we somehow in Great Britain were able to separate those who were loyal and disloyal to Great Britain at that time. They had a number of Italian and German people living in that country. And the individuals who were seen as being a problem were jailed and the rest were not. And we in the United States did not do that for Japanese Americans. We had over a million people of German and Italian ancestry here. And some of them were goose stepping down Fifth Avenue, holding rallies in uh, Madison Square Garden in the 30s. Um, they were not rounded up en masse. Uh, so you get, have to ask yourself, what was the economic motive behind this? What were some of the political motives? We had people with last names like DiMaggio, people who were had names like LaGuardia. You know, they were the mayors. They were the ball players. They, they had enough political clout, so they were not rounded up as a group. And one thing that we as Japanese Americans learned was that we needed to get some political clout. So thank goodness we had, uh, you know, the Bob Matsui's, the um, uh, Normanettas, um, uh, Senator Inouye and others, you know, they, they went to get that political clout and use some of it on behalf of redress. Um, and now we need to use some of the clout we have with a very large Asian American contingent in Congress to push for that phase two of redress to help our Japanese Latin American brothers and sisters and relatives. So um, I think uh, Grace touched on this a little bit, but why is the story of the Japanese Latin Americans um, important for, for other people and uh, to uh, be concerned about? Well, for me, I mean, it shows the multidimensionality of any issue. A lot of times in the political sector, things get reduced to a one-dimensional story. You know, Japanese Americans oppress, Japanese Americans get redress. You know, it just it's an easy story one to the other. But when you start to look at the nuances within the community of the people who, like my grandparents, had been here for decades before the war and were not allowed to get citizenship until 1952 and thereafter, um, when you actually have to get into the granularity of the issue and look at the different ways different people suffered. Everybody suffered, but they suffered in different ways. And we've been talking today about families that were separated, people who uh, some went back to Japan, some were uh, uh, had to go to Seabrook, and all these different forms of suffering, were, they were all suffering, but that's why it's important that each of us understand these things and make sure that everyone gets a measure of redress, both financial and emotional and other. And then we take that, that consciousness that we have and the energy we have, and we keep fighting for redress for our LGBT brothers, sisters, and relatives, for other people who are continuing to suffer from injustice, because uh, just because they're not talking about rounding up Japanese Americans or Japanese Latin Americans, but within the last few years, we've talked about rounding up people who are Muslim, people from certain Middle Eastern countries. So this is still a very real and, and present threat. So, um, and maybe each of you can sort of speak to this. Um, what is it that you want our audience to walk away with from this uh, program? 
Ce e asta? Nu. Put you on the spot there. <laughs> Well, I think this kind of, kind of story has to be told and have to be, you know, spread because I'm not, you know, it's not many people knows about it. I mean, yes, our circle knows about it, but, you know, when I was traveling and uh, I used to, you know, they will ask me where I came from and all of that. And I told them about my story, how the United States government brought us to, you know, to camp or victim. I used to say concentration camp and all of that. And they were shocked to find out that the United States had, a, you know, had that they even did that. So uh, um, there was that what there was one way that I was, you know, used to tell the story, and uh, when I was traveling a lot. And uh, but I think it has to be told because if it, you know, because not many people really still knows about it. Um, for me, the. Um... I think the thing that I like people to walk away with is to understand that um, we're really trying to push for a fuller historical truth. We want to expand the narrative. Uh, it's no longer tenable that the public think that the only people who were incarcerated during World War II were Japanese American citizens. Um, we need to in, uh, expand the narrative to include uh, the 31,000 other uh, persons of German, Italian, Japanese, uh, and Jewish ancestry from the United States and Latin America. We need to tell how it affected not only the Japanese American community, but also these other communities. We need to show that there were not only 10 camps, but there were also about 50 or 60 more camps run by the Department of Justice and the US Army, and that these systems were interrelated. We need to talk about extraordinary rendition of people being kidnapped from other countries and brought here for hostage exchange, and that even the hostage exchange existed. It wasn't just a story about incarceration, it's about uh, deporting people, thrusting civilians into war zones. Uh, it's uh, making them, uh, not letting them return to their homes and sending them to other places after the war. You know, and so it's, we need to have that kind of fuller picture because um, we need to get the lessons from that full picture. If we have a limited view of history, we're gonna get limited lessons and skewed lessons. And we, as we face now um, rising fascism and authoritarianism in this country and around the world, when we're seeing the you know, intensification of racist and anti-immigrant attacks, uh, wartime hysteria, and we're sure seeing a lot of failure of political leadership, our community knows where that can lead. You know, and that's why we need to have really deep discussions and, and get the lessons so that we can build uh, coalitions, not only to preserve our history and pass on legacy, but to actually fight for our democracy and fight for a better vision of the, uh, our country and of the world. Yeah, I, I just want to build on what uh, Grace is saying here because the um, democracy is a it's it's not a spectator sport. We really need to make sure that people, uh, each one of us, walks away from this saying, "I want to learn more about my family. I want to learn about my neighbors. I want to learn about the Japanese Latin Americans that I may not have known about before." But learning is great, it's a first step. But how is each one of us embarking on a lifetime of sustainable activism to spend part of our time and energy building a better world for ourselves and our children? Uh, it's certainly good to have fun and to do the things that we need to do to have a family and, and have a career and all that other stuff. But part of the rent we pay for being on the earth is to leave it a better place. And so what is each one of us doing in that regard? 
Uh, some of us have been here. I see the NCRR people, people who are doing Manzanar pilgrimage. Thank you very much. You've done great work, JCL people. Uh, certainly people uh, from the Gardena Valley JCI, thank you for all you're doing. That's wonderful. But everyone needs to spend some of their time, whether they are a student, whether they are a young professional, whether they are an older person, a retired person, no matter what stage of your life you're in, you need to do something to help to make the world better. And so I hope everyone will walk away, certainly understanding more about Japanese Latin Americans and certainly helping with phase two of redress, but that's just the beginning. Um, being vigilant, as Grace is pointing out, to the rising fascism, rising authoritarianism, uh, what can we do to push back against that and not let that lead to the terrible injustices that hurt all of our families? So there is a lot of work to be done, but it's not something where we need to put our heads down and go, oh my gosh, it's inexorable, it's gonna happen, I have nothing I can do. No, that's not the answer. The answer is, I can do something and look what Michi Weglin and William Horry and Dale Minami and so many people along with all the rest of us, not just the big heroes of the redress movement. All of us have done something. Chiyoko, uh, Grace, so many other people are heroes of this second phase of the redress movement. And I hope we can count all of you as people who will be remembered as people who helped the Japanese Latin Americans get over the finish line and then continued pushing for a better world for everybody else as well. Well, I want to thank all of our guests, Grace Shimizu, Phil Nash, and Chieko Kamisato, and for all that you're doing to help make the world a better place, and for uh, joining us today and, and, and taking uh, time out of your lives to, to share with our audience today. Thank and, you. Uh, I look Thanks. up on the... We've got some information there uh, to contact the Campaign for Justice and the Japanese Peruvian Oral History Project. People could make a note of that. And thanks to Gardena Valley JCI for hosting this. This has been one of the most comprehensive discussions I've been at. So thank you very much. Yes, thank you. Yes, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you again. Thank you. Um, now, uh, I, I, to move along here, um, each year we lose uh, a lot of people in our community, but um, there are a few that I wanted to make note of. Uh, first, is, uh, in, the, in the last year, uh, we've lost uh, Norman Mineta. Uh, during World War II, he was imprisoned at Heart Mountain Concentration Camp in Wyoming. Uh, he started in politics as a councilman in San Jose and became the first Japanese-American mayor of the city. And after that, he was elected to Congress, where he served for 20 years. And during that time, he helped to obtain redress and reparations with the passage of the Civil Liberties Act of 1988. Uh, later, President Clinton appointed him as Secretary of Commerce and President George W. Bush appointed him as Secretary of Transportation. And when you think about uh, the partisan politics going on today, um, imagine someone who was so trusted and respected that he could serve a Democratic and a Republican administration. So he was a rare person indeed. Um, Mineta was also chair of the Board of Trustees at the Japanese American National Museum. And if you wanna learn more about his life, there's a wonderful documentary film, Norman Mineta and His Legacy. Uh, next, I want to acknowledge the passing of uh, Kenjiro Akune. Uh, during World War II, his family was sent to uh, Amachi concentration camp. And from there, he and his brother Harry volunteered for the US Army Military Intelligence Service. Ken went on to serve as a translator during the Tokyo War Crimes Tribunal. Uh, a local Gardena resident, uh, Ken came to the GVJCI and shared his experiences with us on a couple of occasions. And we were so grateful that he was willing to do that. Another veteran that we lost recently was Hiroshi Miyamura, known to many as Hershey. Uh, he served in the 442nd, but became famous for his actions during the Korean War. 
putting himself in harm's way, he almost superhuman acts of bravery protected his fellow soldiers and, her, and earned him the uh, Medal of Honor. He was Grand Marshal of the 2014 Nisi Week Parade. And if you ever had the privilege of meeting him, he was a regular down to earth Nisei grandpa with a loving family that is going to miss him. Finally, I also wanna note the passing of Jim Matsuoka, a true community leader who believed in the power of grassroots organizing. He spoke at the first Manzanar pilgrimage where he had been incarcerated and was a founding member of the National Coalition for Redress and Reparations. During the Commission on Wartime Relocation and Internment of Civilians hearings, uh, there's memorable footage of Jim pounding the table and refusing to be rushed. He had no fear of standing up to authority and speaking his mind in support of what he believed was fair and right. He had been a union leader helping workers in the aerospace industry. Later, he helped students as a counselor in the educational outreach program at Cal State University Long Beach. Um, he also helped seniors as a member of the Little Tokyo People Rights Organization fighting for housing. He fought for the preservation of small businesses in Little Tokyo and supported solidarity with other minority communities. Basically, Jim spent his entire life in service to others. And he's just a, a rare individual um, and, his, and he's just really going to be missed. Um, I've got a few announcements here on behalf of the Guardian Valley Japanese Cultural Institute. Um, and you could uh, see more about this at our website, jci-gardena.org. Um, we'll be celebrating Girls' Day, Hina Matsuri, on Saturday, March 4th. There'll be a program at the JCI from 2 to 3 o'clock. Um, on March 25th, um, there's a program, Transborder Los Angeles, an unknown trans-Pacific history of Japanese-Mexican relations uh, book event. Um, that'll be from two to four o'clock, as I said, on March 25th. The author, Yu Tokunaga, is Associate Professor of History at Kyoto University, Japan, and will be sharing research from uh, his book. Um, I also want to note um, the Manzanar pilgrimage will be in person this year. It's been a while because of COVID, so it'll be nice to be in person again. So that'll be April 29th, and they'll be dedicating their program to uh, Jim Matsuoka. Now, I should also mention that, um, you know, the, this organization is nonprofit. But uh, we appreciate donations, and uh, for a donation of twenty dollars or more, uh, you can receive a set of pins. I happen to be wearing one of them. Um, I don't know. See that? So, so for a donation of twenty dollars or more, you can get uh, that and a uh, GBJCI logo pin. And um, I also want to thank again our co-sponsors, the George and Sakaya Aratani Community Advancement Research Endowment, the UCLA Asian American Studies Center, and Valerie J. Matsumoto, the George and Sakaya Aratani Chair on the Japanese American Incarceration, Redress, and Community for the UCLA. And uh, thank you again to Donald Inadomi and all of our community supporters. Uh, special thanks to our program manager, Stephanie Maeda, who's in the background and who helped uh, really organize this program. And to all of the Day of Remembrance Planning Committee members, it's a volunteer group. So if you're interested in helping us plan next year's Day of Remembrance, uh, just contact Stephanie. It's, uh, um, it's a really wonderful group to work with. So I, I highly recommend it if you're interested in helping out. Thank you once again to our guests, Grace, Phil, and Chieko for being with us today. And thanks to all of you for watching and enjoy the rest of your weekend.
that's the end of our program. Thank you. Okay. Thank you.